um, uh, the fact it's still so common um, is because it's deeply embedded in our biological nature. This also, I think, helps to explain an enormous folklore about the power of the gaze, which is found all, over the, all around the world. In many parts of the world, it's believed that you can affect people or animals or things by the way you look at them. And it's believed if you look at things with anger or most especially envy, then you can blight or harm what you look on. And this is called the evil eye. And there's a great deal of belief about this in Greece, Turkey, the Arab country, India, North Africa. Um, in fact, in many parts of the world, there are very strong folk beliefs in the evil eye. And people wear amulets. In Greece, they have those little blue eyes in Turkey. Um, amulets or prayers. Um, the Greek Orthodox Church has special prayers for freeing people from the malign effects of the evil eye. Um, there's a verse in the Quran about it. Um, many Muslims wear little scrolls uh, to protect them. Um, so this is a terribly widespread belief, and I think that it's um, in the predator-prey context, it, it makes quite good sense as to why people should feel that. Whether the evil eye really does have a bad effect, I don't know, because no one's done the experiments. But um, the sense of being stared at certainly seems to exist and shows there can be an influence of looks. So all this, you see, makes good sense if, when we look at things, the images are projected out through what I call morphic fields, and more specifically, in this case, perceptual fields, the fields of perception, uh, which link the observer to what's observed and connect them together and uh, with these measurable effects. So my first point is that even in ordinary vision, our minds are not confined to the insides of our heads. Uh, the images are outside us where they seem to be, and looking at them can actually influence the thing that we look at. I've recently got interested in a new aspect of this, um, and uh, it's only in the last two or three months. This is a, a new phenomenon I've been studying um, and doing experiments on. And that's not when you're being looked at yourself, but what if two people are looking at the same thing? If I look at this green hydrangea, for example, then I'm saying that my visual perceptual field's projected out and, as it were, touches this hydrangea. Now, if you look at the same green hydrangea, then your perceptual field touches it too, and they might interact. There might be an effect of joint attention, through joint attention to the same object, uh, there could be an actual interaction of our fields. So then the question is, can you tell if somebody else is looking at the same thing you're looking at? Now, I call this, uh, when I thought about it in real life, I, I realized that my own experience of this was what I call the evening standard phenomenon. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're in the tube at rush hour and you read somebody's evening standard over their shoulder, uh, very often uh, they, seem to, they turn around and look rather aggressively at you. <laughs> as if you've invaded their space. Um, how many people here have had that kind of experience? Well, that's most people. That's fascinating. I've never actually asked before in, in, in uh, any large number of people. Um, well, I was discussing this with a sceptical friend last week, Nicholas Humphrey, who's a tremendous sceptic about all these kinds of things. I expected he'd just say, oh, this is rubbish, like your other ideas. But actually... Um, <laughs> What he said was really surprised me. He said that in child development studies, joint attention is one of the really hot topics. Children from about the age of one need to look at the same things as their parents. Like when they're looking at a book together, they say bunny, and the child says bunny. They're looking at or playing together, looking at the same objects, it's a crucial feature of conscious development to have joint attention. It's called joint attention in the psychological literature. And uh, the only people who don't have this are people who are autistic, who just aren't able to form that uh, common bond of attention. Also, Nicholas Humphrey told me, um, among apes and chimpanzees, this seems very important. Recent studies have shown that monkeys and chimpanzees can be very aware of what other ones are looking at. And if a subordinate monkey is aware that a dominant monkey is looking at a banana, it won't try to take it. But if it's not being looked at, uh, it'll rush out and try and grab it. And they become very conscious of what is being looked at. 
I've been doing some recent experiments on joint attention uh, where the two people are looking at an object, they can't see each other, and one of them's looking at it or not looking in a random sequence. Can the other tell when it's being looked at? They've given surprisingly positive and uh, clear results. And it's amazing that a simple phenomenon like this is totally uninvestigated in the 21st century. As far as I know, these are the first experiments ever done, just over the last two or three months. Um, well, that's because most people within the scientific world think it's all inside the head, so it never, they never look at these other phenomena. They're just sort of filtered out. Anyway, all of these things can be investigated experimentally. Um, Another aspect of the extended mind um, is the way that we're linked to other members of the social group. And this leads to uh, phenomena of telepathy. All social animals need to coordinate their behavior in relation to other members of the group. Flocks of birds, for example, flocks of starlings, um, when they turn together, the whole flock can turn extremely rapidly without the birds bumping into each other. How do they know? Um, when the others are going to turn, which, where they're going to turn. It happens too quickly to explain just in terms of normal visual information, looking at the neighbors and responding to them. Um, the best and most up-to-date computer models of this treat the whole flock as a field. And it's really a field phenomenon. I think the whole group has a morphic field. It's an organizing field of the group. The individuals are all within this field. A bit like iron filings around a magnet being within the magnetic field. Um, the same applies to schools of fish and herds of animals. And I think the field of the group is what helps coordinate the members of the group and bind them together. Now, often in animal groups, some members of the group have to go away from the others. They can't all stay within immediate sensory communication distance. For example, in wolves, the adults go out hunting while the young wolves uh, are left behind in the den with a babysitter. Um, and the hunting wolves can range over enormous distances, 100 miles or more. It doesn't mean they stop being a social group because they're beyond earshot of each other. They remain connected even at a distance. And I think that this connection the morphic, through the morphic field, it stretches. When, they, when one lot go away, the field stretches and they remain connected uh, through a kind of almost like an invisible um, thread or elastic band. Um, and I think it's that connection through the field, even at a distance, which acts as the channel of communication for telepathy, which is uh, where one intentions or needs of one part of the group can affect the other. There's an analogy within physics for this process, and the reason I mention it is because uh, it helps to illuminate what for some people is the most puzzling feature of telepathy, namely that it's not distance dependent. I'll come back to that soon. The parallel in physics is quantum non-locality. It's a well-known principle now in quantum physics that if particles have been part of the same system, if they move apart, they remain connected uh, at a distance in such a way that a change in one instantaneously can affect the others. This is called quantum non-locality, non-separability, or entanglement. When Einstein first realized that quantum theory implied this, he thought quantum theory must be wrong, uh, because if it were right, he said it would allow for what he called a spooky action at a distance. Well, experiments show that Einstein was right, uh, wrong and that quantum theory is right. There really is a spooky action at a distance at the very foundations of physics as we know it. Now, you see there's a close analogy there to members of an animal group. If they go apart, uh, if a change in one happens, it could affect the others at a distance. Um, they have to be part of the same group to start with. And um, I think this is the closest analogy in physics to uh, telepathic phenomena. What's interesting uh, in this parallel is that quantum non-locality doesn't fall off with distance. It works just as well over a centimeter as over a mile or a hundred miles. Um, so, and that's actually the true with telepathy. Some people say telepathy can't exist because if it does, it would have to fall off with distance like most physical phenomena. But actually, the most relevant and uh, analogous physical phenomenon doesn't fall off with distance. <laughs> 